She brought him his robe, full-length brocaded china silk, royal blue lined in crimson, with a belt of embroidered seed pearls and velvet lapels. She had chosen it because it was so outlandish, so different from his usual severe style of dress. I wouldn't wear it in front of anybody else in the world, he had told her, holding it gingerly at arm's length when she presented it to him on his birthday. If you do, you'd better not let me catch you at it, she warned. But after the first shock, he had come to enjoy wearing it for her. Hand in hand, they went out onto the terrace, and Hadji and Miriam beamed with delight and bowed them to their seats at the table in the morning sunlight. With a rapid but steely survey, Santane made sure everything was perfect, from the roses in the Lalique vase to the snowy linen and the Fabergé jug of silver gilt and crystal filled with freshly squeezed grapefruit juice before she opened the morning paper and began to read to him. Always in the same order. The headlines and then the parliamentary reports, waiting for him to comment on each, adding her own ideas, and then going on to the financial pages and stock exchange reports, and finally to the sports pages with special emphasis on any mention of polo. Oh, I see you spoke yesterday. A forceful reply from the minister without portfolio, they say. And Blaine smiled as he lifted a fillet off his kipper. Hardly forceful, he demurred. Pissed off, better describes it. What's this about secret societies, she asked. Oh, a bit of a flap over these militant organisations, inspired, it would seem, by the charming Herr Hitler and his gang of political thugs. Anything in it? Santaine sipped at her coffee. She still couldn't get her stomach to accept these English breakfast. You seem to have dismissed the whole thing rather lightly. Then she looked up at him with narrowing eyes. You were covering up, weren't you? She knew him so well, and he grinned guiltily at her. You don't miss a thing, do you? Can you tell me? she asked. Shouldn't, really. He frowned, but she had never betrayed his trust. We are very worried indeed, he admitted. In fact, the Ubas considers it the most serious threat since the 1914 rebellion, when De Wet called out his commanders to fight for the Kaiser. The whole thing is a political nettle and a potential minefield. He paused, and she knew there was more, but she waited quietly for him to make up his mind to tell her. All right, he decided. The UBAS has ordered me to head a commission of inquiry, cabinet level and confidential, into the Oseva Brandvag, which is the most extreme and flourishing of them all. Worse than the Broderbond, even. Why you, Blaine? It's a nasty one, isn't it? Yes, it's a nasty one. And he picked me as a non-Africana, the impartial judge. Of course, I've heard of the OB, she said. There's been talk for years, but nobody seems to know much. Extreme right-wing nationalists, anti-Semitic, anti-black, blaming all the ills of their world on perfidious Albion, secret blood oaths, midnight rallies, a sort of Neanderthal boy scout movement with Mein Kampf as its inspiration. I haven't yet read Mein Kampf. Everyone is talking about it. Is there an English or French translation? she asked. Not officially published, but I have a foreign office translation. It's a rag bag of nightmares and obscenities, a manual of naked aggression and bigotry. I would lend you my copy, but it's appallingly bad literature and the sentiments would sicken you. He may not be a great writer, Santain conceded, but, Blaine, whatever else he has done, Hitler has put Germany on its feet again after the disaster of the Weimar Republic. Germany is the only country in the world with full employment and a booming economy. 
My shares in Krupp and Farben have almost doubled in the last nine months. She stopped as she saw his expression. Is something wrong, Blaine? He had laid his knife and fork down and was staring at her. You have shares in the German armaments industry? He asked quietly, and she nodded. The best investment I have made since gold went off... Um, she broke off. They had never mentioned that again. I have never asked you to do anything for me, have I? He asked, and she considered that carefully. No, you haven't. Ever. Well, I'm asking you now. Sell your shares in German armaments. She looked puzzled. Why, Blaine? Because it is like investing in the propagation of cancer, or like financing Genghis Khan's campaigns. She did not reply, but her expression went blank, and her eyes went out of focus, crossing into a slightly myopic squint. The first time he had seen that happen, he had been alarmed. It, it had taken him some time to realise that when she squinted like that, she was involved in mental arithmetic, and it had fascinated him to see how quickly she made her calculations. Her eyes flicked back into focus, and she smiled agreement. On yesterday's prices, I'll show a profit of £126,000. It was time to sell anyway. I'll cable my London broker as soon as the post office opens. Thank you, my love. Blaine shook his head sorrowfully. But I do wish you had made your profit somewhere else. You may be misjudging the situation, Sherry, she suggested tactfully. Hitler may not be as bad as you think he is. He doesn't have to be as bad as I think he is, Santaine. He only has to be as bad as he says he is in Mein Kampf to qualify for the Chamber of Horrors. Blaine took a mouthful of his kipper and closed his eyes with mild ecstasy. She watched him with a pleasure almost equal to his own. He swallowed, opened his eyes, and declared the subject closed with a wave of his fork. Enough horrors for such a splendid morning, he smiled at her. Read me the sports pages, woman. Sontaine rustled the pages portentously and then composed herself to read aloud. But suddenly the colour drained from her face and she swayed in her seat. Blaine dropped his knife and fork with a clatter and jumped up to steady her. What is it, darling? He was desperately alarmed and almost as pale as she was. She shrugged his hands away and stared at the open newspaper which trembled in her grip. Blaine moved quickly behind her and scanned the page over her shoulder. There was an article on the previous weekend's racing at Kenilworth. Santaine's entry, a good stallion named Bonheur, had lost the feature race by a short head, but that could not have occasioned her distress. Then he saw that she was looking at the foot of the page, and he followed her gaze to a quarter-column photograph of a boxer, in shorts and vest, facing the camera in a formal pose bare fists raised, and a grim expression on his handsome features. Sontaine had never evinced the slightest interest in boxing, and Blaine was puzzled. He read the heading of the article which accompanied the photograph. Feast of fisticuffs, classy field for intervarsity championships, which did nothing to alleviate his puzzlement. He glanced at the footnote beneath the photograph. The Lion of the Kalahari, Manfred de la Rey, the challenger for the intervarsity light heavyweight belt, hard pounding ahead. Manfred de la Rey. Blaine said the name softly, trying to remember where he had last heard it. Then his expression cleared, and he squeezed Santaine's shoulders. Manfred de la Rey. The boy you were looking for, in Windhoek, is this him? Sontaine did not look round, but she nodded jerkily. What is he to you, Sontaine? he asked. 
She was shaken into an emotional turmoil. Otherwise she might have answered differently. But now it was out before she could bite down the words. He's my son. My bastard son. Blaine's hands dropped from her shoulders, and she heard the sharp hissing intake of his breath. I must be mad. Her reaction was immediate, and she thought, I should never have told him. Blaine will never understand. He'll never forgive me. She dared not look round at the shock and accusation she knew she would find on his face. She dropped her head and cupped her hands over her eyes. I've lost him, she thought. Blaine is too upright, too virtuous to accept it. Then his hands touched her again, and they lifted her to her feet and turned her gently to face him. I love you, he said simply. And her tears choked her, and she flung herself against his chest and held him with all her strength. Oh, Blaine, you are so good to me. If you want to tell me about it, I'm here to help you. If you'd rather not talk, then I understand. There is just one thing. Whatever it was, whatever you did, makes no difference to me and my feelings for you. I want to tell you. She fought back her tears of relief and looked up at him. I've never wanted to keep secrets from you. I've wanted to tell you for years now, but I'm a coward. You are many things, my love, but never a coward. He seated her again and drew his own chair close so that he could hold her hand while she talked. Now tell me, he commanded. It's such a long story, Blaine, and you have a cabinet meeting at nine. Affairs of state can wait, he said. Your happiness is the most important thing in the world. So she told him from the time that Lothar de la Rey had rescued her, to the discovery of the Harney Diamond Mine and the birth of Manfred in the desert. She held nothing back. Her love for Lothar, the love of a lonely, forsaken girl for her rescuer. She explained how it had changed to bitter hatred when she discovered that Lothar had murdered the old Bushman woman, who was her foster mother, and how that hatred had focused on Lothar's child, that she was carrying in her womb, and how she had refused even to look upon the newborn infant, but had made the father take it from the childbed, still wet from the act of birth. It was wicked, she whispered, but I was confused and afraid, afraid of the rejection of the Courtney family, if I brought a bastard amongst them. Oh, Blaine, I have regretted it ten thousand times, and hated myself as much as I hated Lothar de la Rey. Do you want to go to Johannesburg and see him again? Blaine asked. We could fly up to watch the championships. The idea startled Santaine. We? she asked. We, Blaine? I couldn't let you go alone. Not to something so disturbing. But can you get away? What about Isabella? she asked. Your need is far more important now, he told her simply. Do you want to go? Oh, yes, Blaine, oh, yes, please. She dabbed away the last tear with her lace table napkin, and he saw her mood shift. It always fascinated him how she could change moods as other women changed their hats. Now she was crisp and quick and businesslike. I am expecting Shasser back from the southwest later today. I'll ring Aby in Windhoek to find out what time they took off. If all is well, we can leave for Johannesburg tomorrow. What time, Blaine? As early as you like, he told her. This afternoon I will clear my desk and make my peace with the Ubas. The weather should be fine this time of year. Perhaps a few thunderstorms on the high veldt. She took his wrist and turned it to see his Rolex watch. Sherry, you can still get to the cabinet meeting if you hurry. She went with him to the garage to see him off, still playing the dutiful wife, and kissed him through the open window of the Bentley. 
I'll ring your office as soon as Shasa arrives, she murmured in his ear. I'll leave a message with Doris, if you are still in the meeting. Doris was Blaine's secretary, and one of the very few people in the world that knew about them. As soon as he was gone, Santaine rushed back into the bedroom and picked up the phone. The line to Windhoek was noisy with crackles and hisses, and A.B. Abraham sounded as though he were in Alaska. They left at first light almost five hours ago, he told her faintly. David is with him, of course. What's the wind, A.B.? she asked. They should have a tailwind all the way. I'd say twenty or thirty miles an hour. Well, thank you. I'll wait at the field for them. That might be a little awkward. A.B. sounded hesitant. There was a lot of secrecy and deliberate vagueness when they got in from the mine yesterday evening, and I wasn't allowed to see them off from the airfield this morning. I think they might have uh, company, if you will excuse the euphemism. As a reflex, Santaine frowned, though she truly could not find it in herself thoroughly to disapprove of Chasse's philanderings. She always excused him with, It's his dateri blood. He can't help himself. Feeling a covert touch of the indulgent pride in her son's effortless successes with the opposite sex. Now she changed the subject. Thank you, A.B., I've signed the new Namaqualand leases, so you can go ahead and draw up the contract. They spoke business for five minutes more, and then Sontaine hung up. She made three more calls, all business, and then phoned her secretary, Advelta of Raiden, and dictated four letters and the cable to her London broker to sell all Krupp and Farben at best. She hung up, sent for Hadji and Miriam, and gave them instructions for the running of the cottage in her absence. Then she made a quick calculation. The Dragon Rapide, a beautiful blue and silver twin-engined aircraft, which Shasa had prevailed on her to buy, could cruise at 150 knots, and with a tailwind of 20 miles an hour, they should be at Young's Field before noon. So we will see just how much Master Chasser's taste in women has improved recently, she thought. She went out to the Daimler and drove slowly around the shoulder of the mountain, below District 6, the colourful Malay quarter, its narrow lanes reverberating to the cries of the Metzin calling the faithful to prayer, the hoot of the Fitzsheller's horns declaring their wares, and the bird-like cries of children and past the hospital of Groot Schur and the university which adjoined Cecil Rhodes's magnificent estate, his legacy to the nation. It must be the most beautiful situation of any university in the world, she thought. The colonnaded stone buildings were set against a backdrop of dark pines, and the sheer sky-high cliff of the mountain, while on the meadows abutting them, grazed small herds of plains animals. Eland and Wildebeest and Zebra. Sight of the university set her thinking about Chasser again. He had just completed his year with a respectable second class. I always suspect those who pass first class in everything, Blaine had remarked when he heard of Chasser's results. Most of them are too clever for their own good, all the good of those around them. I prefer those lesser mortals, for whom the achievement of excellence requires considerable effort. You accuse me of spoiling him, she had smiled. But you are always making excuses for Shasa yourself. Being your son, my love, is not the easiest of tasks for a young man, he had told her, making her bridle furiously. You think I am not good to him? You are very good to him. As I have suggested, perhaps too good to him. It's just that you do not leave much for him. You are so successful, so dominant. You have done it all. What can he do to prove himself? Blaine, I am not domineering, she said. I said dominant, Santaine, not domineering, 
The two are different. I love you because you are dominant. I would despise you if you were domineering. Still, I do not always understand this language of yours. I shall look it up in my dictionary, Santane said. Ask Shasa. English was his only first. Blaine chuckled and then put his arm around her shoulders. You must slacken the rein a little, Santane. Give him space to make his own mistakes and enjoy his own triumphs. If he wants to hunt, even though you do not approve of killing animals that you cannot eat, the Courtenays have all been big game hunters. Old General Courtney slew elephant in their hundreds, and Shasta's father hunted. Let the boy try his hand at it. That and polo are the only things you haven't done before him. What about flying? she challenged. I apologize. And flying, he said. Very well. I will let him go and murder beasts. But Blaine, tell me, will he make the polo team for the Olympics? Frankly, my darling, no. But he is good enough. You said so yourself. Yes, Blaine agreed, he is probably good enough. He has all the fire and dash, a marvellous eye and arm, but he lacks experience. If he were chosen, he'd be the youngest international ever. However, I don't think he will be. I think Clive Ramsay has to get the ride at number two. She stared at him, and he stared back expressionlessly. He knew what she was thinking. As captain, Blaine was one of the national selectors. David will be going to Berlin, she had followed up. David Abrahams is the human version of a gazelle, Blaine had pointed out reasonably. He has the fourth best time in the world for the 200 metres and the third best for the 400. Young Shasser is competing against at least ten of the world's best horsemen for a place. I would give anything in the world for Shasser to go to Berlin, she said. Very likely you would. Blaine had agreed. She had built a new wing to the engineering faculty at the University of Cape Town, the Courtney Building, when it had finally been decided that Shasta would go there rather than to Oxford. Yes, he knew no price was too high for her to pay. I assure you, my love, that I will make very certain. He paused, and she perked up expectantly that I excuse myself from the room when and if Shasta's name ever comes up before the selectors. He's so damned virtuous, she exclaimed aloud now and beat her clenched fist on the steering wheel of the Daimler with frustration, until a sudden vision of the ivory and gold inlaid bed stopped her, and she grinned wickedly. Well... Perhaps virtuous is not the correct word again. The airfield was deserted. She parked the Daimler beside the hangar, where Shasser would not see it from the air. Then she took the travelling rug from the boot and spread it under a tree on the edge of the wide grassy strip. It was one of those lovely summer days, bright sunlight with only patches of cloud over the mountain, a sharp breeze ruffling the stone pines and taking the edge off the heat. She settled down on the rug with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, a book that she had been trying to finish for the last week, and occasionally she glanced up from the page to scan the northern sky. David Abrahams was almost as enchanted with flying as he was with running. That was what had brought him and Shasser together in the beginning. Though A.B. Abrahams had worked for Santaine and been one of her closest personal friends for almost all of David's lifetime, the two boys had really only noticed each other when they went up to university in the same year. 
Since then, they had become inseparable and were founder members of the University Flying Club, for which Sontaine had provided a tiger moth trainer. David was studying law, and it was tacitly understood that when he qualified, he would join his father in Windhoek, which meant naturally that he would become one of Sontaine's people. She had observed the boy carefully over the years and found no vice in him, so she approved of his friendship with Shasa. David was taller than his father, with a lean runner's body and an attractively ugly, humorous face, thick curly hair and a large beaky nose, which he had inherited from Abe. His best features were his dark Semitic eyes and long, sensitive hands, with which he was now manipulating the control column of the Dragon Rapide. He flew with an almost religious dedication, like a priest performing the ritual of some arcane religion. He treated the aircraft as though it were a beautiful living creature, whereas Chasseur flew like an engineer, with understanding and great skill, but without David's mystic passion. David brought that same passion to running, and many of the other things in his existence. This was one of the reasons that Chasseur loved him so dearly. He spiced Chasseur's own life, enhanced the pleasure which Chasseur derived from the things they did together. These past weeks might have been dull and anticlimactic without David. With Sontaine's blessing, withheld strenuously for almost a year, and then mysteriously given at the last moment, the two of them had taken the rapide and flown to the Harney mine the day after they had written their final examinations. At the mine, Dr. Twentyman Jones had arranged for two four-ton trucks to be waiting for them, fully equipped with camping equipment, camp staff, trackers, skinners, and a cook. One of the company prospectors, a man thoroughly versed in the ways of the wild, in bushcraft and hunting big dangerous game, was in charge of the expedition. Their destination was the Caprivi Strip, that remote ribbon of wilderness between Angola and Bekoanaland. Entry to this area was severely restricted, and hunting was forbidden except in exceptional circumstances. Enviously, it was referred to by other sportsmen as the private hunting preserve of the cabinet ministers of the South African government. Blaine Malcolmus had arranged entry permits and hunting licenses for them. Under the grizzled old prospector's quiet instruction and firm hand, the two young men had come to a closer understanding of and respect for the wilderness and the fascinating spectrum of life it contained. In a few weeks, he had taught them something of man's place in the fragile balance of nature and instilled in them the principles of ethical hunting. The death of each individual animal is sad but inevitable. However, the death of the forest, or swamp, or plain that supports the entire species is tragedy, he explained. If the kings and noblemen of Europe had not been avid huntsmen, the stag and the boar and the bear would be extinct today. It was the huntsman who saved the forest from the axe and the plough of the peasants. And they listened attentively at the campfire, as he explained. Men who hunt for love of the creatures they pursue will protect the breeding females and the young from the poachers and save the forest from the goats and cattle. No, my young friends, Robin Hood was a dirty poacher. The Sheriff of Nottingham was the real hero. So they spent enchanted days in the bush, leaving camp on foot while it was still dark and returning dog-weary after the sun had set. Each of them killed his lion and experienced the hunter's sadness and elation at the deed and came out determined to preserve that wild and beautiful country from the predations of unthinking, greedy men. And Shasser, blessed by the chance of birth with the promise of great wealth and influence, came to realize in some small measure how much of that responsibility could one day be his. The women had been superfluous as David had warned they would be. 
However, Shasa had insisted on bringing them, one for himself and one for David. Shasa's choice was almost thirty years old. The best tunes are played on an old fiddle, he assured David. She was also a divorcee. I never break in my own polo ponies. She had big blue eyes, a ripe red mouth, and a pneumatic figure, but was not burdened by an unnecessary amount of brain. David nicknamed her Jumbo, because, he explained, she's so thick that two elephants could walk across her skull side by side. Shasa had prevailed upon Jumbo to bring a friend for David, and she had selected a tall, dark lady, another divorcee, with trailing locks. Her thin arms were loaded with bangles, her long neck with strings of beads. She affected an ivory cigarette holder and had a smouldering intense gaze, but spoke seldom, then usually to ask for another gin. David dubbed her the camel for her insatiable thirst. However, the two of them turned out to be ideal. For while they delivered what was expected of them, with vigour and expertise when called upon to do so, for the rest they were quite content to remain in camp all day, and in the evening demanded little attention and made no attempt to sabotage the conversation around the campfire by joining in. That was probably the most enjoyable holiday I will ever spend. Shasa leaned back in the pilot seat of the rapide, and stared dreamily ahead, content to let David, in the co-pilot seat, do the flying. But it isn't over yet. He glanced at his wristwatch. Another hour before we reach Cape Town. Keep her on course, he told David, and unfastened his safety belt. Where are you going? David demanded. I will not embarrass you by replying to that question, said Jasser. But do not be surprised when the camel comes up to the cockpit to join you. I really am worried about you, David looked grave. You're going to rupture something if you go on like this. Never felt stronger, Shasser assured him as he wriggled out of the seat. Not you, dear boy. It's Jumbo I'm worried about. David shook his head sadly, and Shasser chuckled, slapped his shoulder, and ducked into the rear cabin. The camel looked up at him with that dark, fanatical gaze, and spilled a little gin and tonic down the front of her blouse, while Jumbo giggled and wriggled her fat little rump across the seat to make room for Shasa beside her. He whispered in her ear, and Jumbo looked bewildered, not an unusual expression for her. The Mile High Club... What in heaven's name is that? Shasa whispered again, and she peered out of the side window at the earth below. Goodness, I didn't realise we were that high. You get a special brooch when you become a member, Shasa told her, made of gold and diamonds. And Jumbo's interest flared. Oh, goody, what, what kind of brooch? A flying pussycat with gold wings and diamond eyes. A pussycat? Why a pu... She broke off as understanding dawned in those china-blue eyes. Shasa Courtney, you are awful. She lowered her eyes and blinked demurely, and Shasa winked across the aisle at the camel. I think Davy wants to talk to you. The camel rose obediently, glass in hand, all her bangles and beads jangling as she wobbled from one side of the aisle to the other. An hour later, Shasa brought the rapide in from the mountain side of the airstrip and laid her down on the grass as though he were buttering hot toast. He swung her nose around before she had stopped, taxiing back towards the hangars. With a burst of the starboard engine, he brought her up onto the hard stand and cut the motors. Only then did he notice the yellow Daimler parked in the shadow of the hangar, with Santane standing beside it. Oh, for the love of Allah, Mater is here. Get those beauties flat on the floor. Too late, David groaned. 
Jumbo, bless her, is already waving at your mum through the porthole. Shasser steeled himself to his mother's wrath as the Jumbo came giggling down the boarding ladder, supporting the camel, whose legs had finally let her down. Sontaine said nothing, but she had a taxi waiting beside the Daimler. How she had known about the girls, Shasser would never ask. But she waved the taxi forward and herded the unsteady pair into the back seat with an eye like a stock whip. Get their luggage in the boot, she ordered Shasser tersely. And the moment it was loaded, she nodded at the taxi driver. Take them wherever they want to go. The camel slumped, owl-eyed in her seat. But Jumbo leaned out of the rear window, waving and blowing kisses at Shasa, until the taxi disappeared through the gates of the airfield. And Shasa bowed his head and waited for his mother's icy sarcasm. Did you have a good trip, darling? Santaine asked sweetly, holding up her face to be kissed. And the two girls were never mentioned again. Marvellous! Shasta's kiss was full of gratitude and relief and genuine pleasure at being with her again, and he began to tell her all about it, but she cut him off. Later, she said, right now, I want you to arrange for the repeat to be refueled and checked. We are flying up to Johannesburg tomorrow. In Johannesburg, they stayed at the Carlton. Sontaine owned 30% of the equity in the hotel company, and the royal suite was at her disposal whenever she was in town. The hotel would soon be in need of major renovation, but it occupied a prime position in the centre of Johannesburg. While she dressed for dinner, Sontaine weighed the possibility of having the old building pulled down and redeveloping the site. She would have her architects prepare a report, she decided as she put business out of her mind and devoted the rest of the evening and all of her attention to Blaine. Taking a silly chance of alerting the gossips, she and Blaine danced until two in the morning in the nightclub on the top floor of the hotel. The next day, Blaine had a full series of meetings at the Union buildings in Pretoria, his excuse to Isabella to, for leaving Cape Town, so Sontaine could spend the day with Chasseur. In the morning there was a sale of yearlings at the showgrounds, but the prices were ridiculously high, and they ended up without having bought a single animal. They lunched at the East African Pavilion, where, more than the food, Sontaine enjoyed the envious and speculative glances of the women at the surrounding tables. In the afternoon they went to the zoo. Between feeding the monkeys and rowing on the lake, they discussed Shasser's plans for the future, and she was delighted to learn that he had lost none of his determination to take up his duties and responsibilities with Courtney Mining and Finance as soon as he had obtained his master's degree. They arrived back at the Carlton with plenty of time to change for the boxing. Blaine, already in his dinner jacket, held a whiskey and soda in his hand, and he sprawled in one of the armchairs and watched Sontaine complete her toilet. She enjoyed that. It was playing at being married again, and she called him to hook in her earrings and then paraded for his approval, pirouetting to spread her long skirts. I have never been to a boxing match before, Blaine, she said. Aren't we terribly overdressed? I assure you that black tie is de rigueur. Oh, God, I am so nervous. I don't know what I'm going to say to him, even if I get the chance. She broke off. You did manage to get tickets, didn't you? He showed them to her and smiled. Front row. And I have arranged for a car and driver. Shasa drifted into the suite with a white silk scarf draped casually over the shoulders of his dinner jacket and his black tie minutely and artfully asymmetrical so that it could never be mistaken for one of the modern clip-on monstrosities. He looked so magnificent. Sontaine's heart swelled at sight of him. However am I going to preserve him from the harpies? He kissed her before going to the cabinet and pouring her customary glass of champagne. 
Can I freshen your whisky, sir? He asked Blaine. Thanks, but one is my limit, Chasser. Blaine declined, and Chasser poured himself a dry ginger ale. That was one thing she didn't have to worry about, Sontaine thought. Liquor would never be one of Chasser's weaknesses. Well, Mater, Chasser raised his glass. Here's to your newfound interest in the gentlemanly art of boxing. Are you versed in the general objectives of the game? I think two young men get into a ring and try to kill each other. Is that right? That, Sontaine, is exactly right, Blaine laughed. He never used an endearment in front of Chassa, and not for the first time she wondered what Chassa thought of her and Blaine. He must suspect, surely, but she had enough to worry about this evening without opening that dark door. She drank her champagne, and then, gorgeous in diamonds and silks, on the arms of the two most important men in her world, she swept out to the waiting limousine. The streets of the campus of the University of the Witwatersrand around the gymnasium were solid with parked vehicles and others moving nose to tail up the hill, while the sidewalks were packed with a jostling, excited crowd of students and fight fans from the general public hurrying towards the hall. So their driver was forced to drop them off 200 yards short of the entrance, and they joined the throng on foot. The atmosphere in the hall was noisy and expectant, and as they took their reserved seats, Sontaine was relieved to see that everyone in the first three rows was wearing evening dress, and that there were almost as many ladies as gentlemen in the crowd. She had had nightmares about being the only female in the hall. She sat through the preliminary bouts, trying to appear interested in the lecture she was receiving from both Blaine and Chassa on the finer points of the contests. But the fighters in the lower weight divisions were so small and scrawny that they reminded her of underfed gamecocks, and the flurry of action was fast enough to trick the eye. Besides, her mind and expectations were racing ahead to her first sight of the man she had come to see. Another bout ended. The fighters, bruised and slick with sweat, climbed down from the ring, and an expectant hush fell on the hall and heads began craning around towards the dressing room. Blaine checked his programme and murmured, This is it. Then a bloodthirsty roar went up from the mass of spectators. Here he comes, Blaine touched her arm, but she found she could not turn her head. I wish I had never come, she thought, and shrank down in her seat. I don't want him to see me. The light heavyweight challenger, Manfred de la Rey, came down to the ring first, attended by his coach and his two seconds. And the block of Stellenbosch students let out a roar and brandished their colour banners, launching into the varsity war cry. They were immediately answered by the wits students opposite, with cheers and jeers and stamping of feet. The pandemonium was painful to the eardrums as Manfred climbed up into the ring and did a little shuffling dance, holding his gloved hands above his head, the silk gown swinging from his shoulders like a cloak. His hair had grown longer, and unfashionably it was not dressed with brill cream, but rippled round his head like a gilded cloud as he moved. His jaw was strong, stopping just short of heaviness, and the bones of forehead and cheek were prominent and cleanly chiselled. But his eyes dominated all his other features, pale and implacable as, as those of one of the big predatory cats, emphasised by his dark brows. His shoulders were wide, descending in an inverted pyramid to his hips and the long, clean lines of his legs and his body had been paired of all fat and loose flesh, so that each individual muscle was visible beneath the skin. Shasta stiffened in his seat as he recognised him. He chewed angrily, grinding his teeth together as he remembered the impact of those fists into his flesh and the suffocating slime of dead fish engulfing him as clearly as if the intervening years had never been. I know him, Mater, 
he growled between clenched teeth. He is the one I fought on the jetty at Walvis Bay. Sontaine laid a hand on his arm to restrain him, but she did not look at him nor speak. Instead, she stole a single glance at Blaine's face, and what she saw distressed her. Blaine's expression was grim, and she could feel the anger and the hurt in him. He might have been understanding and magnanimous a thousand miles from here, but with the living proof of her wantonness before him, he could only be thinking of the man who had made this bastard on her, and her acquiescence, nay, her joyous participation in the act. He was thinking of her body, which should be his alone, used by a stranger, by an enemy against whom he had risked his life in battle. Oh, God, why did I come? She tortured herself, and then she felt something melt and change shape inside of her, and knew the answer. Flesh of my flesh, she thought, blood of my blood. And she remembered the weight of him in her womb, and the spasm of burgeoning life deep within her, and all the instincts of motherhood welled and threatened to choke her, and the angry birth cry rang out again in her head, deafening her. My son! She almost cried aloud. My own son! The magnificent fighting man in the ring turned his head in her direction and saw her for the first time. He dropped his hands to his sides and he lifted his chin and stared at her with such concentrated venom, with such bitter hatred in those yellow eyes, that it was like the blow of a spiked mace in her unprotected face. Then Manfred de la Rey deliberately turned his back on her and strode to his corner. The three of them, Blaine, Chasser and Santaine, sat rigid and silent in the midst of the roaring, chanting, heaving multitude. Not one of the three looked at the others, and only Santaine moved, twisting the corner of her sequin shawl in her lap and chewing on her lower lip to prevent it quivering. The champion jumped up into the ring. Ian Rushmore was an inch shorter than Manfred, but broader and deeper in the chest, with long, simian arms heavily muscled and a neck so short and thick that his head seemed to ride directly on his shoulders. Thick, coarse, black hair curled out of the top of his vest, and he looked powerful and dangerous as a wild boar. The bell rang, and in the blood roar of the crowd the two fighters came together in the middle of the ring. Santaine gasped involuntarily at the thud of gloved fist on flesh and bone. Compared to the flickering blows of the lighter, smaller men in the preceding bouts, this was like the meeting of gladiators. She could not see any advantage between the two men as they wheeled and came together and their fists struck those terrible blows that bounced off solid guards of arms and gloves. Then they weaved and ducked and joined again while the crowd around her bellowed in a mindless frenzy. As abruptly as it had begun, it ended, and the fighters separated and went back to the little groups of white-clad seconds who hovered over them tending them lovingly, sponging and kneading their flesh, fanning and massaging and whispering to them. Manfred took a mouthful from the bottle that his big black bearded coach held to his mouth. He sluiced it around his mouth and then turned and looked at Santaine again, singling her out of the crowd with those pale eyes, and deliberately spat the mouthful of water into the bucket at his feet without breaking his gaze. She knew that it was for her. He was spitting his anger at her. She quailed before his rage, and she barely heard Blaine murmur beside her. I scored that round as a draw. De La Rey gave nothing away, and Rushmore is wary of him. Then the boxers were on their feet again, circling and jabbing and pumping leather-clad fists, grunting like labouring bulls at punches thrown and received, 
their bodies shining with the running sweat of their exertions, and bright red patches glowing on their bodies where blows landed. It went on and on, and Santaine felt a sickness rising in her at the primeval savagery of it, at the sounds and smell and spectacle of violence and pain. Rushmore took that one, Blaine said quietly as the round ended, and she actually hated him for his calmness. She felt a clammy sweat break out on her face, and her nausea threatened to overwhelm her as Blaine went on. Della Ray will have to end it in the next two rounds. If he doesn't, Rushmore is going to grind him down. He's getting more confident all the time. She wanted to jump to her feet and hurry out of the hall, but her legs would not function. Then the bell rang, and the two men were out there again in the glare of floodlights, and she tried to look away, but could not. So she stared in sick fascination and saw it happen, saw every vivid detail of it, and knew she would never forget it. She saw the red leather glove blur as it tore through a tiny gap in the defending circle of arms, and she saw the other man's head snap as though it had reached the limit of the hangman's noose as his body fell through the trap. She saw each individual droplet of sweat burst from his sodden locks, as though a heavy stone had been flung into a deep pool, and the features below twisted grotesquely out of shape by the impact into a carnival mask of agony. She heard the blow and the snap of something breaking, teeth or bone or sinew, and she screamed, but her scream was lost and swallowed up in the high surf of sound that burst from a thousand throats around her, and she thrust her fingers into her own mouth as the blows kept coming, so fast that they dissolved before her eyes, so fast that the shocking thuds of impact blended like the sound of an egg beater in thick cream, and flesh turned to red ruin beneath them. She went on screaming as she watched the terrible, killing, yellow rage in the eyes of the son she had borne, watched him become a ravening, murderous beast, and the man before him wilted and broke and reeled away on boneless legs and went down, twisting as he fell, and rolled onto his back, staring up at the overhead lights with blind eyes, snoring in the thick, bright flood that throbbed from his crushed nose into his open mouth. Manfred de la Rey danced over him, still possessed by the killing rage, so that Santen expected him to throw back his head and howl like a wolf, or throw himself upon the broken thing at his feet and rip the bleeding scalp from its head and brandish it high in obscene triumph. Take me away, Blaine, she sobbed. Get me out of this place. And his arms lifted her to her feet and carried her out into the night. Behind her, the blood roar faded, and she gulped down the cold, sweet, high-velt air as though she had been rescued at the very point of drowning. The Lion of the Kalahari writes his own ticket to Berlin, the headlines crowed and Santaine shuddered with the memory and dropped the newspaper over the edge of the bed and reached for the telephone. Shessa, how soon can we leave for home? she demanded, as soon as his voice, blurred with sleep, sounded in her earpiece. And Blaine came through from the bathroom of the hotel suite with shaving lather on his cheeks. You have decided? he asked as soon as she hung up. There is no point in even trying to speak to him, she replied. You saw how he looked at me. Perhaps there will be another time, he tried to comfort her. But he saw the despair in her eyes, and he went to hold her. David Abrahams improved his best time for the 200-metre sprint by almost a second on the first day of the Olympic trials. However, in reaction, he did not do so well as expected on the second day, when he could only just win his final heat in the 400 by half a metre. 
Still, his name was high on the list that was read out at the banquet and ball that closed the five days of the track and field trials. And Shasa, who was sitting beside him, was the first to shake his hand and pound him between the shoulder blades. David was going to Berlin. Two weeks later, the polo trials were held at the Inanda Club in Johannesburg, and Shasser was selected for the B team of possibles against Blaine's A team of probables for the last match of the final day. Sitting high in the grandstand, Sontain watched Shasser play one of the most inspired games of his career, but with despair in her heart, knew that it was still not good enough. Shasser never missed an interception, nor mishit a stroke during the first five chuckers, and once even took a ball out from under the nose of Blaine's pony with a display of audacious riding that brought every person in the grandstand to their feet. Still, it was not good enough, she knew. Clive Ramsay, Shasser's rival for the position of number two in the team that would go to Berlin, had played well all week. He was a man of 42 years with a record of solid achievement behind him, and he had seconded Blaine Malcolmus in almost 30 international matches. His polo career was just reaching its peak, and Santane knew that the selectors could not afford to drop him in favour of the younger, more dashing, probably more gifted, but certainly less experienced and therefore less reliable rider. She could almost see them nodding their heads sagely, puffing their cigars and agreeing, young Courtney will get his chance next time. And she was hating them for it in advance, Blaine Malcolmus included. When suddenly there was a howl from the crowd around her and she jumped to her feet with them. Shasser, thank God, was out of it, galloping wide down the sideline, ready to take the cross as his own number one. Another thrusting young player challenged Clive Ramsay in centre field. It was probably not deliberate, more likely the consequence of a reckless urge to shine. But Shasser's teammate fouled Clive Ramsay murderously on the interception, knocking his polo onto its knees and sending Clive somersaulting from the saddle onto the iron-hard ground. Later that afternoon... X-ray examination confirmed a multiple fracture of Ramsay's femur, which the orthopaedic surgeon was subsequently forced to open up and wire. No polo for at least a year, he ordered, when Clam Clive Ramsay came out of the anaesthetic. So, when the selectors went into conclave, Santaine waited anxiously, allowing herself renewed hope. As he had warned Sontaine he would, Blaine Malcolmus excused himself from the selector's room when Shasser's name came up. But when he was called back in, the chairman grunted, Very well. Young Courtney gets the ride in Clive's place. And despite himself, he felt a lift of elation and pride. Shasser Courtney was the closest he would ever get to having a son of his own. As soon as he could, Blaine telephoned Santaine with the news. It won't be announced until Friday, but Shasser has got his ticket. Santaine was beside herself. Oh, Blaine, darling, how will I contain myself until Friday? she cried. Oh, won't it be fun going to Berlin together, the three of us? We can take the Daimler and drive across Europe. Shasser has never visited Mortom. We can spend a few days in Paris, and you can take me to dinner at La Serre. There is so much to arrange, but we can talk about it when I see you on Saturday. Saturday? He had forgotten. She could hear it in his voice. Sir Gary's birthday! The picnic on the mountain! She sighed with exasperation. Oh, Blaine, it's one of the few times in the year we can be together, legitimately. Is it Sir Gary's birthday again so soon? What happened to the year? He hedged. Oh, Blaine, you did forget, she accused. You can't let me down. It will be a double celebration this year, 
the birthday and chassis selection for the games. Promise you will be there, Blaine. He hesitated an instant longer. He had already promised to take Isabella and the girls to her mother's home at Franchurk for the weekend. I promise, my sweeting, I'll be there. She would never know what that promise would cost him, for Isabella would make him pay with exquisite refinements of cruelty for the broken pledge. It was the drug which had wrought this change in Isabella, he kept assuring herself. Beneath it, she was still the same sweet and gentle person he had married. It was the unremitting pain and the drug which had ravaged her so, and he tried to maintain his respect and affection for her. He tried to remember her loveliness, as delicate and ethereal as the bloom on the petals of a new-blown rose. But that loveliness had long since disappeared, and the petals of the rose had withered, and the smell of corruption was upon her. The sweet, sickly smell of the drug exuded from every pore of her skin, and the deep, never-healing abscesses in her buttocks and at the space of her spine gave off an odour, faint but penetrating, that he had come to abhor. It made it difficult for him to be near her. The smell and the sight of her offended him, but at the same time filled him with helpless pity and corrosive guilt at his infidelity to her. She had wasted to a skeleton. There was no flesh on the bones of those frail legs. They looked like the legs of one of the wading water birds, perfectly straight and shapeless, distorted only by the lumpy knots of her knees and the useless, disproportionately large feet at their extremities. Her arms were just as thin, and the flesh had receded from the bones of her skull. Her lips had drawn back so that her teeth were prominent and exposed, and looked like those of a skull when she tried to smile, or more often grimaced with anger, and her gums were pale, almost white. Her skin also was pale as rice paper, and as dry and lifeless, so thin and translucent that the veins of her hands and forehead showed through it in a blue tracery, and her eyes were the only living things in her face. They had a malicious glitter in them now, as though she resented him for his healthy, lusty body when her own was destroyed and useless. "'How can you, Blaine?' she asked when the question with the same accusing high-pitched whine that she had used countless times before. "'You promised me, Blaine. God knows I see little enough of you as it is. I've been looking forward to this weekend since—' It went on and on and he tried to shut it out. But he found himself thinking of her body again. He had not seen her unclothed in almost seven years. Then, only a month previously, he had walked into her dressing room, believing that she was in the gazebo in the garden, where she spent most of her day. But she was laid out naked on the white sheet of the massage table, with her uniformed day nurse working over her. And the shock must have shown clearly on his face, as the two women looked up at him, startled. Every rib stood out of Isabella's narrow chest, and her breasts were empty pouches of skin that drooped under her armpits. The dark bush of her pubic hair was incongruous and obscene in the bony basin of her pelvis below which these stick-like legs protruded at a disjointed angle, so shrunken that the gap between her thighs was wider than the span of his hands. Get out! She had screamed at him, and he had torn his eyes from her and hurried from the room. Get out! Don't ever come in here again! Now her voice had the same ring in it. Go to your picnic then, if you must. I know what a burden I am to you. I know you can't bear to spend more than a few minutes in my presence. He could not stand it any longer, and he held up a hand to quieten her. You are right, my dear. It was selfish of me to even mention it. We won't speak of it again. Of course, I will go with you. 
he saw the vindictive sparkle of triumph in her eyes. And suddenly, for the very first time, he hated her. And before he could prevent himself, he thought, Why doesn't she die? It would be better for her and for everybody about her if she was dead. Instantly he was appalled at himself, and guilt washed over him, so that he went to her quickly and stooped over the wheelchair, took that cold, bony hand in both of his, and squeezed it gently as he kissed her on the lips. Forgive me, please, he whispered. But unbidden, the image of her in her coffin appeared to him. She lay there, beautiful and serene as she had once been, her hair again once thick and lustrous auburn spread on the white satin pillow. He shut his eyes tightly to try and drive the image away, but it persisted even when she clung to his hand. Oh, it will be such fun to be alone together for a while. She prevented him pulling away. We have so few opportunities to talk any more. You spend so much time in Parliament, and when you aren't about your cabinet duties, you are out on the polo field. I see you every day, morning and evening. Oh, I know, but we never talk. We haven't even discussed Berlin yet, and the time is running out. Is there much we should discuss, my dear? He asked carefully as he disengaged her grip and returned to his own chair on the opposite side of the gazebo. Of course there is, Blaine, she smiled at him, exposing those pale gums behind shrunken lips. It gave her a cunning, almost ferrety expression, which he found disturbing. There are so many arrangements to make. When is the team leaving? I may not travel with the team he told her carefully. I may leave a few weeks earlier and stop off in London and Paris for discussion with the British and French governments before going on to Berlin. Oh, Blaine, we must still make arrangements for me to go with you, she said. And he had to control his expression, for she was watching him carefully. Yes, he said. It will need careful planning. The idea was insupportable. How he longed to be with Santaine, to be able to get away from all pretense and fear of discovery. We shall have to be very certain, my dear, that travelling will not seriously impair your health further. You don't want me with you, do you? Her voice rose sharply. Of course. It's a wonderful chance for you to get away from me. To escape from me. Isabella, please calm yourself. You will do yourself. Don't pretend you care about me. I've been a burden on you for nine years. I'm sure you wish me dead. Isabella. He was shaken by the accuracy of the accusation. Oh, don't play the saint with me, Blaine Malcolmus. I may be locked into this chair, but I see things and I hear things. I don't wish to continue like this, he stood up. We'll talk again once you have control. Sit down, she screeched at him. I won't have you running after your French whore as you always do. He flinched as though she had struck him in the face, and she went on gloatingly. There, I've said it at last. Oh, God, you will never know how close I've been to saying it so many times. You'll never know how good it feels to say it. Whore! Doxy! If you continue, I will leave, he warned. Harlot, she said with relish. Slut! Jade! He turned on his heel and went down the steps of the gazebo, two at a time. Blaine! She screamed after him. Come back! He continued walking up towards the house. And her tone changed. Blaine! I'm sorry! I apologise. Please come back. Please. And he could not refuse her. Reluctantly he turned back and found that his hands were shaking with shock and anger. He thrust them into his pockets and stopped at the top of the steps. All right, 
he said softly. It's true about Sante and Courtney. I love her. But it is also true that we have done everything in our power to prevent you being hurt or humiliated. So don't ever talk like that about her again. If she had allowed it, I would have gone to her years ago and left you. May God forgive me, but I would have walked out on you. Only she kept me here. Only she still keeps me here. She was chastened and shaken as he was, or so he thought, until she raised her eyes again, and he saw that she had feigned repentance merely to lure him back within range of her tongue. I know I cannot go to Berlin with you, Blaine. I have already asked Dr. Joseph, and he has forbidden it. He says the journey would kill me. However, I know what you are planning, you and that woman. I know you have used all your influence to get Shasta Courtney into the team, merely to give her an excuse to be there. I know you are planning a wonderful illicit interlude, and I can't stop you going. He spread his hands in angry resignation. It was useless to protest, and her voice rose again into that harrowing shrillness. Well, let me tell you this. It isn't going to be the honeymoon that the two of you think it is. I've told the girls, both Tara and Matilda, Janine, that they are going with you. I've told them already, and they are besides themselves with excitement. It will be up to you. Either you are heartless enough to disappoint your own daughters, or you will be playing babysitter and not Romeo in Berlin. Her voice rose even higher, and the glitter of her eyes was vindictive. And I warn you, if you refuse to take them with you, Blaine Malcolmus, I will tell them why. I call on God as my witness. I will tell them that their beloved daddy is a cheat and a liar, a libertine and a whoremaster. Although everybody, from the most knowledgeable sports writers to the lowliest fight fan, had confidently expected Manfred de la Rey to be on the boxing squad to go to Berlin. When the official announcement of the team was made, and he was indeed the light heavyweight selection. But in addition, Rolf Stander was the heavyweight choice, and the Reverend Trump Biermann was given the duties of official team coach, and the entire town and university body of Stellenbosch erupted into spontaneous expressions of pride and delight. There was a civic reception and a parade through the streets of the town, while at a mass meeting of the Oseva Brandwag, the commanding general held them up as an example of Africana manhood and extolled their dedication and fighting skills. It is young men such as these who will lead our nation to its rightful place in this land, he told them. And while the massed uniform ranks gave the OB salute, the clenched right fist held across the chest. Manfred and Rolf had the badges of officer rank pinned to their tunics. For God and the Valk, their high commander exhorted them. And Manfred had never before experienced such pride, such determination to honour the trust that had been placed in him. Over the weeks that followed, the excitement continued to build up. There were fittings at the official team tailor for the gold and green blazers, white slacks and broad-brimmed Panama hats, which made up the uniform in which they would march into the Olympic Stadium. There were endless team briefings covering every subject from German etiquette and polite behaviour to travel arrangements and profiles of the opponents whom they were likely to encounter on the way to the final. Both Manfred and Rolf were interviewed by journalists from every magazine and newspaper in the country, and half an hour on the national broadcast radio programme, This Is Your Land, was devoted entirely to them. Only one person seemed unaffected by the excitement. The weeks you are away will seem longer than my whole life, Sarah told Manfred. 
Don't be a silly little duck, he laughed at her. It will be all over before you know it, and I'll be back with a gold medal on my chest. Don't call me a silly little duck, she flashed at him. Not ever again. He stopped laughing. You are right, he said. You are worth more than that. Sarah had taken on herself the duties of timekeeper and second for Manfred's and Roll's evening training runs. On flying bare feet, she took short cuts up the hillside and through the forest to wait for them at prearranged spots with her stopwatch, borrowed from Uncle Trump. A wet sponge and a flask of cold, freshly squeezed orange juice to refresh them. As soon as they had sponged down, drunk and set off again, she would race away, cutting over the crest of the hill or through the valley to wait for them at the next stage. Two weeks before the sailing date, Rolf was forced to miss one of the evening runs when he was obliged to chair an extraordinary meeting of the Students' Representative Council, and Manfred made the run alone. He took the long, steep side of the Hartenbosch mountain at a full run, going with all his strength, flying up the slope with long, elastic strides, lifting his gaze to the crest. Sarah was waiting for him there, and the low autumn sun was behind her, crowning her with gold and striking through the thin stuff of her skirts so that her legs were silhouetted, and he could see every line and lovely angle of her body, almost as though she were unclothed. He pulled up, involuntarily, in full stride, and stood staring up at her, his chest heaving and his heart pounding, not only from his exertions. She is beautiful. He was amazed that he had never seen it before, and he walked up the last angle of the slope slowly, staring at her, confused by this sudden realisation and by the hollow hunger the need that he had kept suppressed, whose existence he had never admitted to himself, but which now suddenly threatened to consume him. She came to meet him the last few paces. Barefoot, she was so much smaller than he was, and that seemed only to increase this terrible hunger. She held out the sponge to him, but when he made no move to take it from her, she stepped up close to him and reached up to wipe the sweat from his neck and shoulders. I dreamed last night we were back in the camp, she whispered as she worked, swabbing his upper arms. Do you remember the camp beside the railway tracks, Manny? He nodded. His throat had closed and he could not reply. I saw my ma lying in the grave. It was a terrible thing. Then it changed, Manny. It wasn't my ma anymore. It was you. You were so pale and handsome. But I knew I had lost you. And I was so eaten by my own sorrow that I wanted to die also and be with you forever. He reached out and took her in his arms, and she sobbed and fell against him. Her body felt so cool and soft and compliant, and her voice shook. Oh, Manny, I don't want to lose you. Please come back to me. Without you, I don't want to go on living. I love you, Sari. His voice was hoarse, and she jerked in his arms. Oh, Manny. I never realized it before, he croaked. Oh, Manny, I have always realized it. I loved you from the first minute of the first day. And I will love you until the last, she cried, and turned her mouth up to his. Kiss me, Manny. Kiss me, or I will die. The touch of her mouth ignited something within him, and the fire and the smoke of it obscured reason and reality. Then they were under the pines beside the path, lying on a bed of soft nettles, and the sultry autumn air was soft as silk upon his bare back but not as soft as her body beneath his, nor as hot as the liquid depths in which she engulfed him. He did not understand what had happened until she cried out, in pain and intense joy. 
but by then it was too late, and he found himself answering her cry, no longer able to draw back, carried along on a swirling tidal wave to a place he had never been before. Nor had he even dreamed of its existence. Reality and consciousness returned slowly from far away, and he drew away from her and stared at her in horror, pulling on his own clothing. What we have done is wicked beyond forgiveness. No. She shook her head vehemently and, still naked, reached for him. No, Manny, it's not wicked when two people love each other. How can it be wicked? It's a thing from God, beautiful and holy. The night before Manfred sailed for Europe with Uncle Trump and the team, he slept in his old room at the manse. When the old house was dark and quiet, Sarah crept down the passage. He had left his door unlatched. Nor did he protest as she let her nightdress fall and crept under the sheet beside him. She stayed until the doves in the oaks outside the stoop began fluttering and softly cooing. Then she kissed him one last time and whispered, now we belong to each other, forever and always. It was only half an hour before sailing, and Santaine's stateroom was so crowded that the stewards were forced to pass the champagne glasses over the heads of the guests and it required only a major expedition to get from one side of the cabin to another. The only one of Santaine's friends who was not present was Blaine Malcolmus. They had decided not to advertise the fact that they were sailing on the same mail ship and had agreed only to meet once they were clear of the harbour. Both A.B. Abrahams, bursting with pride, his arm hooked through David's, and Dr. Twentyman Jones, tall and lugubrious as a marabou stalk, were in the party around Sontaine. They had come all the way down from Windhoek to see her off. Naturally, Sir Gary and Anna were there, as were the Ubas, General Smuts, and his little fluffy-haired wife, with her steel-rimmed spectacles making her look like an advertisement for Maserati tea. In the far corner, Chasser was surrounded by a bevy of young ladies and was in the middle of a story that was being followed with shrieks of amusement and gasps of incredulous wonder, when suddenly he lost track of what he had been saying and stared out of the porthole beside him. Through it, he had a view out onto the boat deck, and what had caught his attention was the glimpse of a girl's head as she passed. He couldn't see her face, just the side and back of her head, a cascade of auburn curls set on a long, slim neck, and a little ear sticking out of the curls at a jaunty angle. It was a fleeting glimpse only, but something about the angle and carriage of that head made him lose immediate interest in the females in front of him. He went up on his toes, spilling champagne, and stuck his head through the porthole. But the girl had passed by, and he only had a back view of her, she had an impossibly narrow waist, but a cheeky little rump that switched from side to side and made her skirt swing rhythmically as she walked. Her calves were perfectly turned, and her ankles slim and neat. She went round the corner with a last twitch of her bottom, leaving Shasta determined that he must get a look at her face. Excuse me, ladies. His audience gave little cries of disappointment, but he eased himself neatly out of their circle, and began working his way towards the door. But before he reached it, the sirens started their booming thunder of warning, and the cry went up, Last call, ladies and gentlemen, all ashore, those who are going ashore. And he knew he had run out of time. She was probably a dog, a backside like heaven and a face like hell, and she almost certainly isn't sailing anyway he consoled himself. Then Dr. Twentyman Jones was shaking his hand and wishing him luck for the games. 
and he tried to forget that bunch of auburn curls and concentrate on his social duties. But it wasn't all that easy. Out on deck he looked for an auburn head going down the gangway or in the crowd on the quay side. But Santain was tugging at his arm as the gap between ship and land opened below them. Come, Cherie, let's go and check that dining room seating. But you have been invited to the captain's table, Mater, he protested. There was an invitation in the... Yes, but you and David haven't, she pointed out. Come along, David. Let's go and find out where they have put the two of you, and have it changed if it's not suitable. She was up to something, Shasa realised. Normally she would take the seating for granted. Secure in the knowledge that her name was all the guarantee of preference that was necessary. But now she was insistent, and she had that look in her eye which he knew so well, and which he called her Machiavellian sparkle. Come along, then, he agreed indulgently, and the three of them went down the walnut panel staircase to the first class dining room on the deck below. At the foot of the stairs, a small group of seasoned travellers were being affable to the head waiter. Five-pound notes were disappearing like magic into that urbane gentleman's pocket, leaving no bulge, and names were being rubbed out and re-pencilled on the seating plan. Standing a little apart from the group was a tall, familiar figure that Chasser recognised instantly. Something about him the expectant turn of his head towards the staircase, told Shasser he was waiting for someone, and his dazzling smile as he saw Sontaine made it clear who that someone was. Good Lord, Mater, Shasser exclaimed, I didn't realise Blaine was sailing today. I thought he would be going later with the others. He broke off. He had felt his mother's grip on his forearm tighten, and the quick catch of her breath as she saw Blaine. They have arranged this, he realised with a flare of amazement. That's what her excitement was. And at last it dawned upon him. You never think it of your own mother, but they are lovers. All these years, and I never saw it. The little things, insignificant at the time, but now full of meaning, came crowding back. Blaine and the Mater, damn me blind! Who would have thought it? And conflicting emotions assailed him. Of all the men in the world, I would have chosen him. In that moment he realised how much Blaine Malcolmus had come to stand in the place of the father he had never known but the thought was followed instantly by a flush of jealous and moral indignation. Blaine Malcolmus, pillar of society and government, and Mater, who is always frowning and shaking her head at me. The naughty little devils. They have been raving away for years without anybody suspecting. Blaine was coming towards them. Santaine, this is a surprise! Mater was laughing and holding out her right hand to him. Gracious me, Blaine Malcolmus, I had no idea you were on board. Shasser thought wryly, what marvellous acting. You have had me and everybody fool for years. The two of you make Clark Gable and Ingrid Bergman look like a pair of beginners. Then, suddenly, it didn't matter any more. The only thing that was important was that there were two girls following Blaine as he came towards Santaine. Santaine, I'm sure you remember my two daughters. This is Tara, and this is Matilda Janine. Tara! Silently, Chasser sang the name in his head. Tara! What a lovely name! It was the girl he had glimpsed on the boat deck, and she was only one hundred times more stunning than he had hoped she might be. 
Tara. She was tall, only a few inches below his own six feet, but her legs were like willow wands, and her waist was like a reed. Tara. She had the face of a Madonna, a serene oval, and her complexion was a mixture of cream and flower petals, almost too perfect, yet redeemed from insipid vacuity by the smoking chestnut hair. Her father's wide, strong mouth and her own eyes, resilient as grey steel and bright with intelligence and determination. She greeted Santaine with the correct amount of deference and then turned to look directly at Shasa. Shasa, you too remember Tara, Blaine told him. She came out to Belt of Raiden four years ago. Was this the same noisy little pest? Shasa stared at her. The one in short skirts with scabs on her bony knees, who had embarrassed him with her boisterous and childish capers. He could not believe it was, and his voice caught in his throat. How, how good to see you again, Tara, after so long. Remember, Tara Malcolmus, she cautioned herself, be controlled and aloof. She almost shivered with shame as she remembered how she had gambled and fawned around him like a puppy begging to be petted. What a callow little beast I was! But she had been smitten by a crush so powerful at first sight of him that the pain of it still lingered even now. However, she managed to display the right shade of indifference as she murmured, Oh, have we met? I must have forgotten, forgive me. She held out her hand. Well, it's pleasant to meet you again. Um, Shasa? Yes, Shasa, he agreed. And he took the hand as though it were a holy talisman. Why haven't we met again since then? he asked himself. And immediately he saw the answer. It was deliberate. Blaine and Mater made damn sure that we never met again, in case it complicated their own little arrangement. They did not want Tara reporting back to her mama. But he was too happy to be angry with them now. Have you made your table reservations, he asked, without relinquishing her hand. Daddy is sitting at the captain's table, Tara pouted lovingly at her father, and we are to be left all alone. The four of us could sit together, Shasta suggested quickly. Let's go and talk to the maitre. Blaine and Santaine exchanged relieved glances. It was all going exactly as they had planned, with one twist they had not foreseen. Matilda Janine had blushed as she shook hands with David Abrahams. Of the two sisters, she was the ugly duckling, for she had inherited not only her father's wide mouth, but his large nose and prominent ears as well, and her hair was not auburn but ginger carrot, but he's got a big nose too, she thought defiantly, as she studied David. And then her thoughts went off on a tangent. If Tara tells him I'm only sixteen, I'll just die. The voyage was a tempest of emotions, full of delights and surprises and frustrations and agonies for all of them. During the fourteen days of the p passage to Southampton, Blaine and Santaine saw very little of the four youngsters, meeting them for a cocktail beside the ship's pool before lunch and for a duty dance after dinner, David and Shasser each taking a turn at whirling Santaine around the floor while Blaine did the same to his daughters. Then there would be a quick exchange of glances between the four young people and they would make their elaborate excuses before all disappearing down into the tourist class where the real fun was leaving Blaine and Santaine to their staid pleasures on the upper decks. Tara, in a one-piece bathing costume of lime green, was the most magnificent sight Shasa had ever laid eyes upon. Her breasts, under the clinging material, were the shape of unripe pears, 
and when she came from the pool with water streaming down those long elegant limbs, he could make out the dimple of her navel through the cloth and the hard little marbles of her nipples, and it took all his control to prevent himself groaning out loud. Matilda Janine and David discovered a mutual zany and irreverent sense of humour and kept each other in convulsions of laughter most of the time. Matilda Janine was up at 4.30 each morning, no matter how late they'd got to bed, to give David raucous encouragement as he made his fifty circuits of the boat deck. He moves like a panther, she told herself, long and smooth and graceful. And she had to think up fifty new witticisms each morning to shout at him as he went bounding past her. They chased each other around the pool and wrestled ecstatically below the surface once they had managed to fall in, locked in each other's arms. But apart from a furtive pecking kiss at the door of the cadem that Matilda Janine shared with Tara, neither of them even considered carrying it any further. Although David had benefited from his brief relationship with the camel, it never occurred to him to indulge in the same acrobatics with someone as special as Matty. Chassa, on the other hand, suffered under no such inhibitions. He was vastly more sexually experienced than David, and once he had recovered from the initial awe of Tara's beauty, he launched an insidious but determined assault on the fortress of her virginity. However, his rewards were even less spectacular than David's. It took him almost a week to work up to the stage of intimacy where Tara would allow him to spread suntan oil on her back and shoulders. In the small hours of the morning, when the lights on the dance floor were dimmed for the last dance, and the band played the sugary, romantic Poinciana, she laid her velvet-soft cheek against his. But when he tried to press his lower body against hers, she allowed it for only moments before she arched her back. And when he tried to kiss her at the cabin door, she held him off with both hands on his chest and gave him that low, tantalising laugh. The silly little witch is totally frigid, Shasa told his reflection in the shaving mirror. She probably has an iceberg in her knickers. Thought of those regions made him shiver with frustration, and he resolved to break off the chase. He thought of the five or six other females on board, not all of them young, who had looked at him with unmistakable invitation in their eyes. I could have any or all of them, instead of panting along behind Miss Tin Knickers. But an hour later, he was partnering her in the mixed doubles deck quart championships, or smoothing suntan oil on that flawless, finely muscled back, with fingers that trembled with agonised desire or trying to keep level with her in a discussion of the merits and demerits of the government's plans to disenfranchise the coloured voters of the Cape province. He had discovered with some dismay that Tara Malcolmus had a highly developed political conscience, and that even though it was vaguely understood between him and Mater that Chassa would one day go into politics and parliament, his grasp of and interest in the complex problems of the country was not of the same calibre as Tara's. She held views that were almost as disturbing to him as her physical attractions. I believe, as Daddy does, that far from taking the vote away from the few black people who have it, we should be giving it to all of them. All of them? Shasa was appalled. You don't really believe that, do you? Well, of course I do. Not all at once, but on a civilization basis. Government by those who have proved fit to govern. Give the vote to all those who have the right standards of education and responsibility. In two generations, every man and woman, black or white, could be on the roll. Shasa shuddered at the thought. His own aspirations to a seat in the house would not survive that. 
but this was probably the least radical of her opinions. How can we prevent people from owning land in their own country, or from selling their labour in the best market, or prohibit them from collective bargaining? Trade unions were the tools of Lenin and the devil. That was a fact Shasser had taken in with his mother's milk. She's a Bolshe. But God, what a beautiful Bolshe, he thought, and pulled her to her feet to break the unpalatable lecture. Come on, let's go for a swim. He's an ignorant fascist, she thought furiously. But when she saw the way the other women looked at him from behind their sunglasses, she wanted to claw their eyes out of their faces. And at night, in her bunk, when she thought about the touch of his hands on her bare back and the feel of him against her on the dance floor, she blushed in the darkness at the fantasies that filled her head. If I just let it start, just the barest beginning, I know I won't be able to stop him. I won't even want to stop him. And she steeled herself against him. Controlled and aloof, she repeated, like a charm against the treacherous wiles of her, of her own body. By some extraordinary coincidence, it just so happened that Blaine Malcolmus had shipped his Bentley in the hold, alongside Sontaine's Daimler. We could drive to Berlin in convoy, Sontaine exclaimed, as though the idea had just occurred to her, and there was clamorous acceptance of the idea from the four younger members of the party, and immediate jockeying and lobbying for seats in the two vehicles. Sontaine and Blaine, protesting mildly, allowed themselves to be allocated the Bentley, while the others, driven by Chasser, would follow in the Daimler. From Le Havre, they drove the dusty roads of northwestern France, through the town that still had the ring of terror in their names, Amiens and Arras. The green grass had covered the muddy battlefields where Blaine had fought, but the fields of white crosses were bright as daisies in the sunlight. May God grant that mankind never has to live through that again, Blaine murmured, and Sontaine reached across and took his hand. In the little village of Mortom, they parked in front of the auberge in the main street, and when Sontaine walked in through the front door to inquire for lodgings, Madame, behind the desk, recognised her instantly and screeched with excitement. Henri, viens vite! C'est Mademoiselle de Thierry du Chateau! And she rushed to embrace Sontaine and buss her on both cheeks. A travelling salesman was ousted and the best rooms put at their disposal. A little explanation was needed when Sontaine and Blaine asked for separate accommodation, but the meal they were served that night was exquisitely nostalgic for Sontaine with all the specialities, terrines and truffles and tartes, with the wine of the region, while Madame stood beside the table and gave Sontaine all the gossip, the deaths and births, the marriages and elopements and liaisons of the last nineteen years. In the early morning, Sontaine and Chasser left the others sleeping and drove up to the chateau. It was rubble and black scorched walls, pierced with empty windows and shell holes, overgrown and desolate. And Sontaine stood in the ruins and wept for her father, who had burned with the great house, rather than abandon it to the advancing Germans. After the war, the estate had been sold off to pay the debts that the old man had accumulated over a lifetime of good living and hard drinking. It was now owned by Hennessy, the great cognac firm. The old man would have enjoyed that little irony. Sontaine smiled at the thought. Together they climbed the hillock beyond the ruined chateau, and from the crest Sontaine pointed out the orchard and plantation that marked the old wartime airfield. That is where your father's squadron was stationed, on the edge of the orchard. I waited here every morning for the squadron to take off, 
and I would wave them away to battle. They flew SE-5As, didn't they, asked Sasha. Only later. At first it was the old Sopwiths. She was looking up at the sky. Your father's machine was painted bright yellow. I called him Le Petit Jaune, the little yellow one. I can see him now in his flying helmet. He used to lift the goggles so I could see his eyes as he flew past me. Oh, Chassa, how noble and gay and young he was. A young eagle going up into the blue. They descended the hillock and drove slowly back between the vineyards. Sante asked Sasha to stop beside a small stone-walled barn at the corner of North Field. He watched her, puzzled, as she stood for a few minutes in the doorway of the thatched building and then came back to the Daimler with a faint smile on her lips and a soft glow in her eyes. She saw his inquiring look and told him, Your father and I used to meet here. In a clairvoyant insight, Shasa realised that in this rickety old building, in a foreign land, he had been conceived. The strangeness of this knowledge remained with him as they drove back towards the auberge. At the entrance to the village in front of the little church, with its green copper spire, they topped again and went into the cemetery. Michael Courtney's grave was at the far end, beneath a yew tree. Sontaine had ordered the headstone from Africa, but had never seen it before. A marble eagle, perched on a tattered battle standard, was on the point of flight, with wings spread. Chassa thought it was a little too flamboyant for a memorial to the dead. They stood side by side and read the inscription. Sacred to the memory of Captain Michael Courtney, RFC, killed in action 19th of April, 1917. Greater love hath no man. Weeds had grown up around the headstone, and they knelt together and tidied the grave. Then they stood at the foot of it, their heads bowed. Chassa had expected to be profoundly moved by his father's grave, but instead he felt remote and untouched. The man beneath the headstone had become clay long before he was born. He had felt closer to Michael Courtney 6,000 miles from here, when he had slept in his bed, worn his old thorn-proof tweed jacket, handled his purdy shotgun and his fishing rods, or used his gold-nibbed pen and his platinum and onyx dress studs. They went back along the path to the church and found the village priest in the vestry. He was a young man, not much older than Chassa, and Sontaine was disappointed, for his youth seemed to her a break in her tenuous link to Michael and the past. However, she wrote out two large cheques, one for the repairs to the church's copper spire, and the other to pay for fresh flowers to be placed on Michael's grave each Sunday in perpetuity. And they went back to the Daimler with the priest's fervent benedictions following them. The following day they all drove on to Paris. Sontaine had wired ahead for accommodation at the Ritz in the Place Vendôme. Blaine and Sontaine had a full round of engagements, meetings, luncheons and dinners, with various members of the French government. So the four younger members of the party were left to their own devices, and they very soon discovered that Paris was the city of romance and excitement. They rode to the first étage of the Eiffel Tower in one of the creaking elevators and then raced each other up the open steel staircase to the very top and oohed and aahed at the city spread below them. They strolled with arms linked along the footpath on the river bank and under the fabulous bridges of the, of the Seine. With her baby box brownie, Tara photographed them on the steps of Montmartre with the Sacre Coeur as a backdrop. They drank coffee and ate croissants in the sidewalk cafes and lunched at the Café de la Paix, dined at La Coupole and saw La Traviata at the Opera. 
At midnight, when the girls had said good night to Sontaine and their father, and retired demurely and dutifully to their rooms, Chasse and David smuggled them out over the balcony, and they went dancing in the boite on the left bank, or sat listening to jazz in the cellars of Montparnasse, where they discovered a black trombone player who blew a horn that made your spine curl, and a little brasserie where you could eat snails and wild strawberries at three in the morning. In the last dawn, as they crept down the corridor to get the girls back to their room, they heard familiar voices in the elevator cage as it came up to their floor. And only just in time, the four of them dived down the staircase and lay in a heap on the first landing, the girls stuffing handkerchiefs into their mouths to stifle their giggles, while just above them, Blaine and Sontaine, resplendent in full evening dress and oblivious of their presence, left the elevator and arm in arm strolled down the passage towards Sontaine's suite. They left Paris with regret and reached the German border in high spirits. They presented their passports to the French douanier and were waved through to the German side with typical Gallic panache. They left the Bentley and Daimler parked at the barrier and trooped into the German border post, where they were struck immediately by the difference in attitude between the two groups of officials. The two German officers were meticulously turned out, their leather polished to a gloss, their caps set at the exact regulation angle, and the black swastikas in a field of crimson and white on their left arms. From the wall behind their desk, a framed portrait of the Führer, stern and moustached, glowered down upon them. Blaine laid a sheaf of passports on the desk top in front of them, with a friendly Guten Tag, mein Herr, and stood chatting to Sontaine while one of the officials went through the passports one at a time, comparing each of the holders to his or her photograph, and then stamping the visa with the Black Eagle and Swastika device, before going on to the next passport. Dave Abraham's passport was at the bottom of the pile, and when the officer came to it, he paused and re-read the front cover, and then pedantically turned and perused every single page in the document, looking up at David again and scrutinising his features after each page. After a few minutes of this, the group around David fell silent and began exchanging puzzled glances. I think something is wrong, Blaine, Sontaine said quietly, and he went to the desk. Problem? Blaine asked, and the official answered him in stilted but correct English. Abrahams? It is a Jewish name, no? Blaine flushed with irritation, but before he could reply, David stepped up to the desk beside him. It is a Jewish name, yes, he said quietly and the official nodded thoughtfully, tapping the passport with his forefinger. You admit you are Jewish? I am Jewish, David replied in the same level tone. It is not written in your passport that you are Jewish, the customs officer pointed out. <clears throat> Should it be? David asked. The officer shrugged and then asked, You wish to enter Germany? And you are Jewish? I wish to enter Germany to take part in the Olympic Games, to which I have been invited by the German government. Ah! You are an Olympic athlete, a Jewish Olympic athlete. No, I am a South African Olympic athlete. Is my visa in order? The official did not reply to the question. Wait here, please. He went through the rear door, carrying David's passport with him. They heard him speaking to someone in the back office, and they all looked at Tara. She was the only one in the party who understood a little German. She had studied the language for her matriculation examinations and passed it on the higher grade. What is he saying? Blaine asked. They are talking too fast, a lot about Jews and Olympics, Tara answered. Then the rear door opened, and the original official came back with a plump, rosy-faced man who was clearly his superior, for his uniform and his manner were grander. 
Who is Abraham's? He demanded. I am. You are a Jew? You admit you are a Jew? Yes, I am a Jew. I have said so many times. Is there something wrong with my visa? You will wait, please. This time, all three officials retired to the rear office, once more taking David's passport with them. They heard the tinkle of a telephone bell, and then the senior officer's voice, loud and obsequious. What's going on? They looked to Tara. He's talking to somebody in Berlin, Tara told them. He's explaining about David. The one-sided conversation in the next room ended with Jawohl, mein Kapitan, repeated four times, each time louder, and then a shouted Heil Hitler and the tinkle of the telephone. The three officials filed back into the front office. The rosy-faced superior stamped David's passport and handed it to him with a flourish. Welcome to the Third Reich, he declared, and flung his right hand up, palm open, and extended towards them and shouted, Heil Hitler! Matilda Janine burst into nervous giggles. Isn't he a lark? Blaine seized her arm and marched her out of the office. 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 So they drove into Germany, all of them silent and subdued. They found lodgings in the first roadside inn, and, contrary to her usual custom, Sontaine accepted them without first inspecting the beds, the plumbing, and the kitchens. After dinner, nobody wanted to play cards or explore the village, and they were in bed before ten o'clock. However, by breakfast time, they had recovered their high spirits, and Matilda Janine had them laughing with a poem she had composed in honour of the extraordinary feats that her father... Shassa and David were about to perform in the games ahead of them. Their good humour increased during the day's easy journey through the beautiful German countryside, the villages and hilltop castles right out of the pages of Hans Andersen fairy tales, the forests of pine trees in dark contrast to the open meadows and the tumbling waterfalls, crossed by arch bridges of stone. Along the way, they saw groups of young people in national dress, the boys in lederhosen and feathered loden hats, the girls in dirndls, who waved and called greetings as the two big motor cars sped past. They lunched in an inn full of people and music and laughter, on a haunch of wild boar with roast potatoes and apples, and drank a moselle with the taste of the grape and sunshine in its pale greenish depths. Everybody is so happy and prosperous looking, Shassa remarked as he glanced around the crowded room. The only country in the world with no unemployment and no poor, Santaine agreed. But Blaine tasted his wine and said nothing. That afternoon they entered the northern plain on the approach to Berlin, and Shassa, who was leading, swung the Daimler off onto the verge so suddenly that David grabbed for the dashboard, and the girls in the back squeaked with alarm. Shasser jumped out, leaving the engine still running, shouting, David, David, just look at them! Aren't they the most beautiful things you've ever seen? The others piled out beside him and stared up at the sky, while Blaine pulled the Bentley in behind the Daimler, and he and Santaine climbed out to join them, shading their eyes against the slanting sun. There was an airfield adjoining the highway. The hangar buildings were painted silver, and the windsock waved its long white arm in the small breeze. A stick of three fighter aircraft turned out of the sun, coming around in formation to line up for the strip. They were sleek as sharks, their bellies and lower wings painted sky blue, their upper surfaces speckled with camouflage, and the boss of their propellers bright yellow. What are they? Blaine called across to the two young pilots, and they answered as one. 109s, Messerschmitts. 
The machine gun snouts bristled from the leading edges of the wings, and the eyes of the cannon peered malevolently from the centre of the spinning propeller bosses. What I'd give to fly one of those! An arm, and a leg, and my hope of salvation! The three fighters changed formation into line astern and descended towards the airfield. They say that they can do 350 mph, straight and level. Oh, sweet, oh, sweet, look at them fly! The girls were infected by their excitement, and they clapped and laughed as the war machines passed low over their heads and touched down on the airstrip only a few hundred yards beyond. It would be worth going to war just to get a shot at flying something like that, Shasa exulted, and Blaine turned back to the Bentley to hide his sudden anger at the remark. Sontaine slid into the seat beside him, and they drove in silence for five minutes before she said, He's so young and foolish sometimes. I'm sorry, Blaine. I know how he upset you. He sighed. We were the same. We called it a great game, and thought it was going to be the glory of a lifetime that would make us men and heroes. Nobody told us about the ripped guts and the terror, and how dead men smell on the fifth day in the sun. It won't happen again, Santaine said fiercely. Please, don't let it happen again. In her mind's eye, she saw once again the burning aircraft with the body of the man she loved, blackening and twisting and crisping. Then the face was no longer Michael's, but that of his only son, and Shasa's beautiful face burst open like a sausage held too close to the flames, and the sweet young life juices burst from it. Please stop the car, Blaine, she whispered. I think I'm going to be ill. With hard driving, they could have reached Berlin that night, but in one of the smaller towns that they were passing through, the streets were decorated for some sort of celebration and Sontaine asked and was told that it was the festival of the local patron saint. Oh, Blaine, let's stay over, she cried, and they joined in the festival. That afternoon there was a procession. An effigy of the saint was paraded through the narrow cobbled streets, and a band followed it, with angelic little blonde girls in national dress and small boys in uniform. Those are the Hitler youth, Blaine explained, something like old Baden-Powell's Boy Scouts, but with a much stronger emphasis on German national aspirations and patriotism. After the parade, there was torchlit dancing in the town square, and barrows serving foaming tankards of beer, or glasses of sect, the German equivalent of champagne, and serving girls with lace aprons and cheeks like ripe apples, carrying overflowing platters of rich food, pigs, trotters and veal, smoked mackerel and cheeses. They found a table at the corner of the square, and the revellers at the neighbouring tables called greetings and merry banter to them. And they drank beer and danced and beat time to the oompa pa band with their beer mugs. Then, quite abruptly, the atmosphere changed. The laughter around them became brittle and forced, and there was a wariness in the faces and eyes of revellers at the adjacent tables. The band began to play too loudly, and the dancers became feverish in their exertions. Four men had entered the square. They wore brown uniforms with cross straps over the chest and the ubiquitous swastika armbands. Their brown cloth caps with rounded peaks were pulled low and their leather chin straps were down. Each of them carried a small wooden collection box with a slot in the lid, and they spread out and went to each of the tables. Everybody made a donation, but as they pushed their coins into the slot of the box, they avoided looking at the brown uniformed collectors. Their laughter was forced and nervous, and they looked into their tankards or at their own hands until the collectors had passed on to the next table when they exchanged relieved glances. Who are these people? 
Sontaine asked innocently, making no attempt to hide her interest. They are the SA, replied. Stormtroopers. The bully boys of the National Socia Socialist Party. Look at that one. The trooper he had chosen had the bland, heavy face of a peasant, dull and brutal. Is it not remarkable that there are always people to do this type of work? The need finds the man. Let us pray that his is not the face of the new Germany. The stormtrooper had noticed their unconcealed interest, and he came directly to their table with that menacing, deliberate swagger. Papers, he said. <clears throat> he wants our papers, Tara translated, and Blaine handed over his passport. Ah, foreign tourists! The stormtrooper's manner changed. He smiled ingratiatingly and handed back Blaine's passport with a few pleasant words. He says, Welcome to the paradise of National Socialist Germany, Tara translated, and Blaine nodded. He says, You will see how the German people are now happy and proud, and something else that I didn't catch. Tell him we hope that they will always be happy and proud. The trooper beamed and clicked the heels of his jackboots as he sprang to attention. Heil Hitler! He gave the Nazi salute, and Matilda Janine dissolved into helpless giggles. I can't help it, she gasped as Blaine gave her a sharp look and a shake of the head. It just slays me when they do that. The stormtroopers left the square, and they could feel the tension ease. The band slackened its frenetic beat, and the dancers slowed down. People looked directly at one another and smiled naturally. That night, Sontaine pulled the fat goose-down duvet up around her ears and snuggled into the curve of Blaine's arm. "'Have you noticed,' she asked, "'how the people here seemed caught between feverish laughter and nervous tears?' Blaine was silent for a while, and then he grunted, There is a smell in the air that troubles me. It seems to me that it is the stench of some deadly plague. And he shuddered slightly and drew her closer to him. With the Daimler leading, they streamed down the wide white autobahn into the suburbs of the German capital. So much water, so many canals and so many trees. The city's built on a series of canals, Tara explained. Rivers trapped between the old terminal moraines that lie east to west. How is it you always know everything? Chasse interrupted her, a touch of real exasperation under his teasing tone. Unlike some I could name, I am acutely literate, you know. She flashed back, and David winced theatrically. Ouch! That hurt, and it wasn't even aimed at me. Very well, little miss know-it-all, Chasser challenged. If you were so clever, what does that sign say? He pointed ahead to a large white signboard beside the autobahn. The lettering was in black, and Tara read it aloud. It says... Jews, keep straight on. This road will take you back to Jerusalem, where you belong. As she realised what she had said, she flushed with embarrassment and leaned forward to touch David's shoulder over the back of his seat. Oh, David, I'm so sorry. I should never have uttered such rot. David sat straight, staring ahead through the windscreen, and then, after a few seconds... He gave a thin little smile. Welcome to Berlin, he whispered, the centre of Aryan civilization. Welcome to Berlin! Welcome to Berlin! The train that had brought them half across Europe slid into the station, clouds of steam hissing from the vacuum brakes, and the cries of greeting almost drowned by the beat of the band playing a rousing martial air. Welcome to Berlin! 
The waiting crowd surged forward at the moment their coach came to a standstill, and Manfred de la Rey stepped down from the balcony to be surrounded by well-wishers, smiling happy faces and friendly hand-clasps, laughing girls and wreaths of flowers, shouted questions and popping flashbulbs. The other athletes, all dressed like him in green blazers with gold piping, white slacks and shoes and Panama hats, were also surrounded and mobbed, and it was some minutes before a loud voice rose above the hubbub. Attention, please. May I have your attention? The band beat out a ruffle of drums, while a tall man in a dark uniform and steel-rimmed spectacles stepped forward. First of all, let me offer you the warm greetings of the Führer and the German people, and we welcome you to these 11th Olympic Games of the modern era. We know that you will represent the spirit and courage of the South African nation, and we wish you all success and many, many medals. Amidst clapping and laughing, the speaker held up his hands. There are motor vehicles waiting to take you to your quarters in the Olympic Village, where you will find all preparations have been made to make your stay with us both memorable and enjoyable. Now, it is my pleasant duty to introduce the young lady who will be your guide and your interpreter over the next few weeks. He beckoned to somebody in the crowd, and a young woman stepped out into the space beside him and turned to face the band of athletes. There was a collective sigh and hum of appreciation. This is Heidi Kramer. She was tall and strong, but unmistakably feminine, with hips and bosom like an hourglass, yet touched with a dancer's grace and a gymnast's poise. Her hair was the colour of the Kalahari dawn, Manfred thought, and her teeth, when she smiled, were perfect, their edges minutely serrated and translucent as fine bone china. But her eyes were beyond description, bluer and clearer than the high African sky at noon, and he knew without any hesitation that she was the most magnificent woman he had ever seen. At the thought, he made a silent, guilty apology to Sarah. But compared to this German Valkyrie, Sarah was a sweet little tabby cat beside a female leopard in her prime. Now Heidi will arrange for your baggage to be collected and will get you all seated in the limousines. From now on, if there is anything you need, ask Heidi. She is your big sister and your stepmother. They laughed and whistled and cheered, and Heidi, smiling and charming but quick and efficient, took over. Within minutes, their baggage had been whisked away by a band of uniformed porters, and she led them down the long, glass-domed platform to the magnificent entrance portals of the railway station, where a line of black Mercedes limousines was waiting for them. Manfred, Uncle Tromp, and Rolf Stander climbed into the back of, of one of them, and the driver was just about to pull away, when Heidi waved to him and came running back along the curb. She wore high heels, and they threw tension on her calf muscles, emphasising their lovely lines and the fine delicacy of her ankles. Neither Sarah nor any of the girls Manfred knew at home wore high heels. Heidi opened the front passenger door and stuck her head into the Mercedes. You gentlemen will object if I ride with you, yes? She asked with that radiant smile, and they all protested vigorously, even Uncle Trump joining in. No, no, please come in. She slipped into the seat beside the driver, slammed the door, and immediately wriggled around so that she was facing them, with her arms folded along the back of the seat. I am so excited to meet you, she told them in her accented English. I have read so much about Africa, the animals and the Zulus, and one day I will travel there. You must promise to tell me all about your beautiful country, and I will tell you all about my beautiful Germany. They agreed enthusiastically, and she looked directly at Uncle Trump. Now, let me guess. You 
will be the Reverend Trump Bierman, the team boxing coach, she asked, and Uncle Trump beamed. How clever of you. I have seen your photograph, she admitted. How could I forget such a magnificent beard? Uncle Trump looked highly gratified. But you must tell me who the others are. This is Rolf Stander, our heavyweight boxer. Uncle Trump introduced them. And this is Manfred de la Rey, our light heavyweight. Manfred was certain that she reacted to his name, a lift to one corner of her mouth and a slight narrowing of the eyes. Then she was smiling again. We will all be good friends, she said, and Manfred replied in German, My people, the Afrikaners, have always been the loyal friends of the German people. Oh, your German is perfect, she exclaimed with delight in the same language. Where did you learn to speak like a true German? My paternal grandmother and my mother were both pure-blooded Germans, Manfred replied. Then you will find much to interest you in our country. And she switched back to English and began to lecture, pointing out the sights of the city as the line of black Mercedes, Olympic pennants fluttering on the bonnets, sped through the streets. This is the famous Unter den Linden, the street we Berliners love so dearly. It was broad and magnificent, with linden trees growing down the promenade that divided the double carriageway. The street is a mile long. That is the royal palace behind us, and there ahead of us is the Brandenburg Tor. The tall colonnades of the monument were decked with enormous banners that hung from the quadriga charioteer group of figures on the summit to the ground far below. The crimson and black swastika, flanked by the multicoloured rings of the Olympic symbol, billowed and heaved in the light breeze. That is the State Opera House, Heidi turned to point through the side window. It was built in 1741. She was entertaining and informative. See how the people of Berlin welcome you, she cried, with that gay, brittle enthusiasm which seemed to characterize all the citizens of National Socialist Germany. Look, look! Berlin was a city of flags and banners. From every public building, department store, apartment block, and private dwelling, the flags fluttered and waved. Swastikas and the Olympic rings, thousands upon tens of thousands. When they came at last to the apartment block in the Olympic village that had been set aside for them, an honor guard of the Hitler youth with burning torches waited to welcome them, and another band drawn up on the sidewalk, broke into the voice of South Africa, the national anthem. Inside the building, Heidi issued each of them with a booklet filled with coloured coupons by which every last detail of their personal arrangements were organised, from their room and the bed on which they would sleep, and the buses that would carry them to and from the Olympic complex, to the changing rooms and the numbers of the lockers that they had been allocated at the stadium. Here in this house, you will have your own chef and dining hall. Food will be prepared to your own preference with due regard to any special diets or tastes. There is a doctor and a dentist available at any hour. Dry cleaning and laundry, radios and telephones, a private masseur for the team, a secretary with a typewriter. It had all been arranged, and they were amazed by the precise, meticulous planning. Please find your rooms. Your luggage is already there waiting for you. Unpack and relax. Tomorrow morning, I will take you on the bus for a tour of the Reich Sportfeld, the Olympic complex. It is ten miles from here, so we will leave immediately after breakfast at 8.30 a.m. In the meantime, if there is anything, anything at all that you want, you have only to ask me. I know what I'd like to ask her for. One of the weightlifters whispered, rolling his eyes, and Manfred clenched his fists with anger at the impertinence, even though Heidi had not heard it. Until tomorrow, she called gaily, and went through to the kitchens to talk to the chef. 
Now that is what I call a woman, Uncle Trump growled. I give thanks that I am a man of the cloth, old and happily married, and beyond all the temptations of Eve. There were cries of mock commiserations, for Uncle Trump was by this time everybody's uncle. All right, he was suddenly stern. Running shoes, all you lazy young dogs. A quick ten miles before supper, please. Heidi was waiting for them when they came down to breakfast, gay and bright and smiling, answering their questions, distributing mail from home, sorting out a dozen small problems quickly and without fuss, and then, when they had eaten, taking them off in a group to the bus station. Most of the athletes from the other countries were in residence, and the village was bustling and full of tense excitement. Men and women in sporting attire running through the streets, calling to each other in a multiplicity of tongues, their superb physical condition showing in their bright young faces and in every movement that they made. When they came to the stadium, the size of it awed them all. A huge complex of halls, gymnasiums and covered swimming pools surrounded the oval track and field theatre. The banks of seating seemed to reach away forever, and the Olympic altar at the far end with the unlit tripod torch gave a sense of religious solemnity to this temple devoted to the worship of the human body. It took the morning for them to see it all, and they had a hundred questions between them. Heidi answered them all, but more than once Manfred found her walking beside him, and when they spoke German together it gave them a sense of intimacy, even in the crowd. It was not his imagination alone, for Rolf had noticed the special attention Manfred was receiving. How are you enjoying your German lessons? he asked innocently at lunch. And when Manfred snarled at him, he grinned unrepentantly. Their hosts had arranged sparring partners from the local boxing clubs, and over the days that followed, Uncle Trump drove them hard towards the pinnacle of their training. Manfred tore at his opponents, slamming punches into the thick padding that covered their midriffs and heads, so that even with that protection, none of them lasted more than a round or two before calling for quarter. And when Manfred went back to his corner and looked around, it was usually to find Heidi Kramer watching from somewhere near at hand a flush on her flawless neck, a strange, intent look in those impossibly blue eyes, her lips slightly parted, and the tip of her pink tongue held between sharp white teeth. However, it was only after four days of training that he found himself alone with her. He had finished a hard session in the gymnasium, and after showering and changing into grey slacks and a varsity sweater, he went out through the front entrance of the stadium, he had almost reached the bus station when she called his name and ran to catch up with him. I am also going back to the village. I have to talk to the chef. May I ride the bus with you? She must have been waiting for him, and he felt flattered and a little nervous. She had a free, hip-swinging walk, and her hair swayed around her head like a sheet of golden silk when she looked up at him as they walked down to the bus station. 